Good to see you all here this morning. If you're visiting with us, I see quite a few in our audience. We are, you're an honored guest here in our assembly. We are glad you're here, that you're seeking out the things of God uh, to worship Him with His people. I want to thank uh, George and Dennis for the comments made on the table this morning, and Ron uh, Matthews for leading our song service. Uh, if you open your Bibles this morning, we'll be in the book of James again, uh, picking up where we left off last week and looking at what James has to teach us concerning the nuts and bolts of Christian living. Um, and once again, I'll be in the New International Version, just because I think it words the book of James in such a way that makes it incredibly clear and applicable. And as you know, as I said last week, it almost pains me to say because New American Standard is my Bible. If it was good enough for Moses in the mountain, it's good enough for me. Anyway, uh, so if you're opening up the book of James, last week we only got through the first two chapters, of, and again, we're just hitting the highlights, the big picture stuff that James is trying to teach his recipients. Is this, again, this is, this is one of the earliest letters we have written to Christians. And these Christians are probably left asking, okay, I'm saved, now what? How is my life supposed to look? What am I supposed to do on a day-to-day -day basis? And while James, we could spend a whole month, if not longer, getting into the nitty-gritty on it, I want, I've just summed up the chapters in, in these five major lessons. And last week we looked at, the first lesson is, and he wants to get this out of the way at the very beginning, you're going to have trials and temptations. No way around it. Uh, looking at verse 2 here, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. There's many who have this idea that in Christianity, if I become a Christian, that it's going to be the easy life. I get the large bank account, I'm going to have the house and the Cadillac in the driveway. And Christ never promised those kind of blessings. Christ promised all spiritual blessings, abundant blessings and assurance and and our covenant relationship with God, but he never guaranteed that our life was going to be free from trouble. And in fact, a trouble-free life, honestly, in my opinion, is not a life worth living. It's an untested life. It's a, it, it produces a person who's never been tried or tested, has never developed a strong character to weather those storms of life. And that's what James is talking about here. We should rejoice in our trials, not because we have them, Again, we don't rejoice that we have cancer or we have a headache. We rejoice in the fact that those trials of life can strengthen us because we look past those trials to our reward. It can strengthen us to weather bigger trials and bigger storms. He also talks about uh, temptations here. The temptations come from within. And the only way to weather temptations is asking God for wisdom, as he will say in verse 5 of chapter 1, and putting that into practice and walking close to God. It's pretty hard to succumb to temptation if you're walking hand in hand with Jesus and doing the things he would have us to do. And then the second chapter dealt with how the overarching theme is faith acts without partiality. A living, true faith is a faith that puts its knowledge into action. It does the things that Jesus is telling us to do. And it does so without showing any partiality to rich or poor to anyone, no matter what their background. Um, in fact, he would go on to say in verse 9 of chapter 2 that to show partiality is to be guilty of sin. Uh, he says here in chapter 2 in verse 9, and he says here, But if you are show, uh, show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. He can't make any more clear. Because again, expand this out a little bit, Christian means a follower of Christ. God did not show partiality or favoritism when he sent his son. God did not show favoritism when he sent his son to die for all man's sins. God has not established a church to, be favored, uh, to favor one particular race of people, but it's welcome to all people no matter what their backgrounds are. And so for Christians to show favoritism is to act in a nature that's contrary to what, how Christ acted. Making distinctions where the Bible has made no such distinctions. 
And we go on later to see that, and this is directly tied to the showing of favoritism, because some may have been saying, well, you know, I'm a Christian, I love my brethren, and I, I just, you know, that's, that's it. I have my faith, and I, I don't need to show, I, I don't need to put that in action. That's what the second part of chapter 2 is dealing with, is faith and works. And he gives a direct example here in chapter 2 that would relate to the problems he's dealing with in chapter 2 of the rich abusing the poor and so forth. He says, what good is it, chap, uh, verse 14, he says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing to provide his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But the problem might have been some, and, and this not the first time this pops up in the Bible, but some have said, well, I have faith. I'm, I'm just a faith Christian. And I remember, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm works. That's all I do. And Paul, uh, not Paul, James, you get in the habit of saying Paul so often. James is telling us here, that is the most ridiculous thing he's ever heard. There is no works Christians. There is no faith Christians. There are just Christians who put their faith in action. And he can't make it any more plain than the end of verse 17. Faith, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So you can't claim to be a Christian and not do the things you know you ought to be doing and not live out what we should be doing. Next, as we're going to dig in here for the next uh, little bit, it's probably one of the more difficult chapters of James because it applies to everyone and we've all been in situations like this. Tongue trouble of not controlling our tongue. Uh, some have called it chronic foot and mouth disease because you're always saying the wrong thing. Uh, James even starts out, uh, I like the artwork here of this next verse, but in James chapter 3 and verse 5, he compares the tongue to a spark that sets a whole forest ablaze. Uh, summer before last, when I was, get, the summer before I moved down here, um, Oregon on average was hotter than Tucson. And that's because the whole state was on fire. Uh, when I had moved down, when I drove, pulled down my driveway Labor Day weekend, it was sunny, clear skies where my house is at. And as I went further down through southern Oregon, I'm like, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Why is, why is there fog? And I got outside and took one breath of the air, and it wasn't fog. It was, it was smoke. But the largest fire that the state of Oregon has had to deal with caused millions of dollars of damage. Some parts of Oregon irreparably damaged of these forests was started by some teenager playing with a, uh, some sort of firecracker or some sort of small firework in the middle of the forest. Small little spark set nearly the whole state on fire. And James likens that to our tongues and our words. You know, we grew up with this saying of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. And as we got older, we realized that's the dumbest thing that anyone could ever have said to us. The real phrase, and it, I'll get it, it's not as cute and it doesn't rhyme, but sticks and stones may break my bones, but words leave emotional scars. Words are powerful. And that's why James spends a whole chapter dealing with taming of the tongue. So he says, mind your tongue. And he starts out, he says, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because we, you know that uh, we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep the whole body in check. There's a couple of things here. It seems like contextually there are some who are pretty, you know, hot in the trigger, wanting to start teaching, wanting to start expanding on the law when they were still young and didn't know much. And James is not giving a prohibition against people wanting to teach. I don't think there's a single congregation of the Lord's people who, hasn't said, who has said, no, we don't need more Bible class teachers. We're all full. Uh, we always need more teachers. What James is warning here that says, don't just jump into it. You need to treat with the respect it deserves because you're not just teaching mathematics or history. You're teaching the Word of God. 
I mean, as a teacher, as one who's in a public setting and stands before the people, he has to be stable in what he says. He has to know what is correct doctrine. And it's interesting, it says, those who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, if some have tried to go either way on this, I think it's a little bit both and on the judgment there. You're going to be held responsible for that, what you taught, and if you led God's people into error, you're going to be held accountable for that. Just like Levi was in the Exodus. Aaron was. And it's interesting, too, I, I always have to bring up this point, that when the priesthood was being initiated, and they all had to give their sacrifices, Aaron's sacrifice was very specific. He had to sacrifice a bull calf. The very thing he made a golden image of. Apparently Jewish commentators have been aware of this irony for centuries of the fact that Aaron, because of his failure as a teacher, when it came time to be, re to be put into the priesthood, had to sacrifice the very thing that represented his error. It's, 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 it's stricter judgment from God, but also from other people. The teacher, no matter what the capacity, puts himself open to criticism. Somebody who may disagree. So not only do they have to know correct doctrine, but they have to also have to be able to defend it. And that requires not necessarily mastery of the tongue, but a wise usage of language. But this doesn't just apply to teachers. It applies to all Christians. And it's interesting that James seems to be dealing with some supposed objection. Well, I don't struggle with what I say. And you can almost see James kind of leaning back going, like Hugh would often. Okay, huh. If you, if you say you're a perfect man, well, you're, if you say you, can't, you don't struggle with what you're saying, you're a perfect man. And we know scripturally there was only one perfect man. And it's almost reassuring that James does say in verse 2 that we all stumble in many ways. He recognizes the universality of this trouble. We all struggle with what we say. We've all been in situations where we said something and immediately we go, should not have said that. But the timing was wrong. Or you said too much. Or said too little. And then James goes on to talk about how powerful a tool the tongue is. He says, when we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are stirred by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider with a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the body part, parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person. It sets the whole course of life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I read a little bit further there, but... He gives us several different examples, and we start out with verse 5 about how the tongue is likened to a spark that starts a forest fire. He gives several examples about how you know, we see these massive ships, and the ships we have today are ten times as large as what the disciples would have been familiar with in the first century. But still, proportional to their size, they are still controlled by the small rudder. And it's interesting, too, again, with the words, it's, I'm, I'm hitting this point home because it's James does as well. Trust can take a lifetime to build and a moment to destroy by saying the wrong thing. And James keeps warning, gives us warning after warning of a, after warning, guard your tongue. And that's why he, he keeps on going. He just states the reality of the thing of the situation that he wishes would not be in existence. He says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of, in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt, a salt spring produce fresh water. 
And it's not so much, uh, tongue trouble's bad enough. But someone who can't control their tongue, or is the situation that James describes, that's an indication of a much bigger problem. And we touched on some of this two weeks ago, but it's an indication of a heart problem. If you want to turn over to Matthew, the 12th chapter, real quick here. Um, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, uh, it, it seems to me that James has this verse in mind. The, the language is very similar. He seems to be alluding to the teachings of Christ here. But in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, Excuse me here while I find it. It says here in Matthew 12 and verse 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables, and he did not say anything to them. Well then. Thanks, Bob. That's what happens when you use a Bible that's not your own. See, mine has it highlighted, underlined, and, and starred because I find this section act to be the most terrifying se- section of Scripture for me personally. To read aloud what Bob had just read. Verse 34, he said, You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak of what is good? For the mouth speaks out of which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That doesn't terrify you. I don't know what will. But back in verse 34, tongue trouble is a sign of a heart condition. For it's out of the overflow of the heart pours forth our words. And so if you find yourself cursing all the time, outbursts of anger, ungrateful, hateful towards your fellow man, that's not just a problem with your words, that's a problem with you. And that needs to be corrected. By bringing yourself in line with what Christ has taught. No, it's interesting, when Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount, to pray for those who persecute you, It's kind of hard to be angry with somebody when I'm praying for them. It's really hard to be angry with somebody when I'm praying for them. It's kind of hard for me to be angry with an individual who cuts me off on the speedway, if immediately I say a a prayer for them that they would have a safe journey because clearly they're in a hurry for some place. Plus, it keeps my blood pressure low. But James also offers advice. For, because then we're left, if the tongue is this powerful and this uncontrollable, what do we do? We have to go back to James chapter 1, uh, looking in verse 19. He says, Know this, my beloved brethren. Let everyone, every, per, every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It will not kill you to wait a few seconds before you respond to somebody. So often that in a conversation, especially on controversial matters or matters of disagreement, we get so in a hurry to say the next thing we want to say that we're not listening to the person on what they're saying. Don't say the first thing that pops in your head. That's called not having a filter. Develop a filter. Think before you speak. But James gives us this advice on how to tame that tongue. It's like, just slow down. Don't be in such a rush to say something. But James still has a few other lessons to teach us here. Um, If we look at chapter 4. Now, it's unfortunate the chapter break is there because 4 and uh, trouble with the tongue directly is a can directly cause the issues of four. Chapter four, the big problem that we're dealing with here is the fact that there's divisions among the brethren. There's fighting, there's quarrels. 
shows a wrong attitude. But he starts out here saying that you're going to have many problems in life. He talks about what, what causes fights and quarrels among you. Don't they come for your desires that battle within you? You want, someone, uh, you want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, do you know, not know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says without reason that the spirit has caused to live in us tends towards envy, but, the, but he gives us more grace? This is what the scripture says. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he outlines the situation here. Apparently these Christians were fighting with each other. They were, again, had all sorts of wrong motives and attitudes. They were just looking for their next big, big gain to spend on themselves. And, you, and that is, a lot of that is greatly caused by trouble with the tongue. But also the solution that James will give in the next section of Scripture is to submit to God. And he outlined some of these problems, and I recognize now that I got some these order mixed up. Um, we're going to back up real quick. Verse 1 is talking about conflicts with, with brethren. We are very fortunate and blessed to live in a congregation, to be in a congregation, where this is not the norm. In fact, I can't think of my short year and a half or so of where we've had conflicts among brethren here. And it's because we have the right attitude. And we'll get to that, some of that attitude in a moment. Bad friends in verse 4, Satan's constant attacks. We get in seven, uh, we'll look at in uh, 7b here in a moment. But the solution he gives is we need to submit to God and his wisdom. So picking up right there in verse 7, James actually outlines five things that we need to do to avoid these conflicts and get through them. So starting in verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning, your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So the things, he lists, he lists out separately these things. But we would say a lot of them are the same. Submit yourselves then to God. It also says in different places, humble yourselves before the Lord. Come near to God. Resist the devil and grieve and mourn about the divisions and the sins that you've been doing. Show the proper attitude towards this division. But you notice all these things, the constant theme is you need to submit to God. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian for only a day, if you've been a Christian for 70 plus years. This lesson holds fast every single day of your life. Who are you going to submit to? Sin leading to death or God leading to righteousness? And he, doesn't, he just doesn't say it for any reason. He keeps on going. He says, Brothers, do not slander with one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, he is not talking and condemning all judgments here. In Matthew chapter 7, a verse that often gets pulled out of context, talks about, judge not lest you be judged. For in the same way that you judge, that measure shall be applied to you. And that was my paraphrase of those two verses. James, just like Jesus, is talking about unrighteous or unfair judgments. Kind of the, the plank in the eye syndrome, as some may call it. You sit in judgment all high money of your brothers, but you're completely ignorant to the fact that you have your own sins. You have your own problems and often are more glaring to others than the little nitty-gritty stuff that you're picking fault with, finding fault with with your brethren. And again, this ties back to the tongue trouble because verse 11 talks about slander and speaks against his brother and judges him. There's a difference between admonishing a brother and just coming up to him and having all sorts of accusations and just standing in judgment of them. That's slanderous, James would say. 
have just, it may be for no other reason than you just think they're not living right. And you have no evidence otherwise, you just perhaps don't like the individual. Or they don't dress the way you think they should in the worship service. Or some other unfounded fault that there's no scriptural bias for. And again, nothing is in my mind about this congregation. But it is a problem for Christians in general. Otherwise, James would not be writing about it. That's still part of the, of the old life of the world getting in and you working to get it away from it. But he gives us additional reason why we need to submit to God in general. So, submit to God and humble yourself before him will go a long way to solving any conflict in your life, really. But again, as if we needed to be told this, he tells us that he's our judge and he is in control. He says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to that, this city and that city and spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know that you will happen, what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that, and it is. And it is, you boast and brag, and, and all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and does not do it, sins. A couple things here. One, that last verse there, I hope you would underline it. That, that solves, that sums up how to apply Bible knowledge, really, of what you're responsible for and doing. If you understand the right thing according to Scripture and you have the ability and opportunity to do such a thing, it's your responsibility. I can't explain that verse any more than that. It's pretty straightforward. Than that. If you know what's the right thing to do and you don't do it, that's sin. But he gives us reason again why we need to keep submitting to God because he is our judge, as he talked about there in verse uh, uh, 12. And 13 tells us that he is in control of all things. And when we don't submit to God, we're, we are putting ourselves in the judgment seat. We're putting ourselves in God's place. The, the fact that when we don't submit to him, we're putting ourselves in the idea we know better, we know people's where they're going, because we're passing judgment on them, we think we know what's going to happen because we don't give any credit to God when it comes to making our plans. We're acting, a life that does not submit to God is a life act, lived in arrogance. And as we sum things up here in chapter 5, and I, I realize we're not digging real deep. These are the big, big lessons that James is trying to get uh, us to understand here. But in chapter 5, the big thing we come away with is keep, watch, and pray. Now, it starts off with the warning and condemnation of, in the context, these rich Christians who were, who were abusing their brethren. They were withholding wages. They were storing up so much for themselves that it was just rusting. It was getting moth-eaten. And again, I want to outline here, Jesus is not condoning wealth, condemning wealth. There we go. And he's not advocating for some sort of social redistribution plan. But tied back to verse 17, as we're going to start off here, anyone who knows the right thing and does not do it, to him that is sin. Going back in chapter uh, 2, at the beginning of that chapter, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Uh, verse 15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? Now keep those two verses in mind because that's going to help us put into context James's condemnation of these people here and what their practices are. He says here, now listen, you rich people. Whip Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and, and moth have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you have failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord, all powerful. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have, you have condemned and murdered innocent men, you who are, who are not opposing you. So keeping those two verses in mind, what we talked about before, he who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, 
And the one who says it was better be warned and be filled, go on your way, but does not provide for those means. These are individuals who were in a position to do good to the brethren, who knew what they ought to be doing. And instead of providing for the needs because they were in a position to be able to do so, they failed to do it. James talks about here they have so much wealth, and basically the three ways you could acquire wealth in the ancient world. Clothing, monetary, and food. They have so much that he says, your gold and silver are rusting, your clothes are being moth-eaten, and the food is going to waste. So again, he's not advocating some sort of monetary redistribution plan. But these were Christians, again, who were in a position to do good, who knew what they ought to be doing, and chose not to do it. In fact, it wasn't just that. They were abusing the weaker Christians who could not do anything about it. And this goes back to chapter 2 about showing partiality. These are the same Christians that were showing preference to these rich people versus the poor people. And James points out, these are the same people that drag you to court. These are the same people who are withholding wages from you. But the big lesson we learn from this is not that James is condemning wealth. But the lesson we learn is we need to have the right focus in life. The abuses these individuals were making because they were focused on the here and now. They were not focused on where they're going. You see, when it comes to the world, the world lives their life forwards, as it were. They look at what's in front of them. You know, oftentimes, this is the joke we had in high school, but you, know, you need to work to get good grades so you can get into a good college and get a good job so you can work 40 years and retire for 10 and then die. That was life. That's how the world lives. They live forward. Christians live life backwards. We start out knowing where we're going. We know we're all going to end up, our Bill Gates or the man on the street, we're all going to end up six feet under. And we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The difference between the worldly person and the Christian is the Christian knows that's coming. And the Christian lives his life in light of that day. And so I order my life knowing that there's a judgment coming and I'm going to have to stand and give account. And so because of that, I want to be found faithful in what God has given me. I want to be found a good worker for the things he's entrusted me in. If I'm able to do good to my brethren, I ought to do it. But these individuals were looking at the here and now, and they weren't paying attention to what was coming. Because, I mean, the condemnation is, is your, your riches are crying out against you. You have fat yourselves with the day of slaughter. You, uh, and he's talking about, it's, they have so much, and they're not really realizing the abuses. They're not seeing where they're going. And so their rotting wealth should have been testimony enough to them that they need to be doing something, and they weren't. Jesus teaches a similar uh, lesson about this in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6 here, uh, starting in verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy. There's some parallels there, isn't there not? Uh, and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. Just like the tongue. It shows priorities. It shows what's important in life. It shows how you're living life, what your aim is, where are you going. And so he says you need to have the right focus in life. That's the first section. With the right focus, we look to greater reward. We look past the temporary. We look past the trials and temptations that we're dealing with here. Very quickly here, verses 7 through 12. He says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the fall and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Do not grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. And you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. 
The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no's be no, or you'll be condemned. He deals with two things right here. Twelve seems to be just an added proverb he throws in. I'm going to deal with that first before we go back there. Basically, twelve is, you shouldn't need to swear by anything for people to believe you. If you are a Christian of integrity and wisdom, it should be evident. And you shouldn't have to say any more than yes or no when you give an answer. Any more than that is showing where your real, how, what your real character is. But going back up, talks about the rich opposing you. So he gives them their condemnation how you've, you should know better. Now he switches to those who are being oppressed or have troubles in this life, which I think a lot of us fall underneath the second category. But he makes the comparison that we need to have patience in this, in this, in these trials, which again ties back to chapter 1. That the trials and temptations of this life produce perseverance, that we might be perfect and adequate, able to endure with these trials. And he likens this, we need to have the patience as the farmer. Every spring uh, in the house we had out in the middle of the country, we, we allotted a large uh, field in the back of our property for our own garden. Um, and every year we would try and time it after the last hard frost of the year, but some, most years we didn't time it right, so there was always at least one night where I'm woken up, as my dad heard the weather report late, and he says, we got to go cover up the plants, and so I'm out there holding the flashlight, because that's all I was allowed to do. Anyway. But you didn't plant the crops and expect them to pop up the next day. We didn't have tomato plants either. I don't know what my dad did. There was no added fertilizer or anything else. We grew tomato trees. Because the plants were about 6'2", and the fruit I mean, looked like mini pumpkins on how big these tomatoes were. But you don't get a crop like that. You don't get a harvest like that. You don't get that kind of fruit instantaneously. You had to wait all summer. And it took diligence. You had to weed. You had to make sure none of the critters were getting there and eating or destroying the plants. And James likens to the Christian's way on the coming of the Lord to the farmer who waits on produce. We wait patiently for that good fruit to be, to be born. Wait patiently for that harvest. And we hope and we pray it's going to be an abundant, abundant harvest for God. That it's going to be good fruit. That we would be faithful in what he's been given to us. But the thing is, we're able to endure those trials and temptations because we're not living in the here and now. We're living in light of what's coming. We know what's coming. And if I have a goal at the end, I can endure whatever life throws at me because I know there's a better world to come. And as we wrap, wrap things up here, he says, while we wait, pray. James ends the book with prayer. He talks about, is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. They will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another so you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The old King James said, availeth much. Well, that's what availeth much means. It's powerful and effective. We love efficiency. We love things that are effective. Amazon is very effective at getting my packages to my doorstep. In fact, they built that a new warehouse uh, in the town I grew up in. And over uh, the winter, uh, when I was up in Oregon again, we were able to order something that morning. And they were able to process the payment, the order, pull it from the shelves, package it, ship it, and it was at our doorstep by 5 o'clock. That's efficient. That's effective. Prayer is a million times more effective than Amazon. And this goes, uh, James ties this all together, but he's going back to chapter 1 about prayer. You need to ask in faith without doubting. Because if you're doubting, that does not show your faithfulness and your trust in God. You're not sure he's able to do these things. Ask without any doubt, knowing the full assurance that God, if we ask anything according to his will, he will grant us our petitions. If Christians understood how powerful prayer is, the world would be a different place. Tucson would be a different place. 
This congregation would be a different place. But he ends with that. He says, while you're waiting, while you're enduring, don't forget to pray. And really, we could sum up the book of James with another scripture from Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and, and sin which clings to so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The Christian life is like that of a marathon runner. You don't want to expend all your energy out to the front because then you have nothing left and you're not going to be able to finish the race. But you don't want to get to the end of the marathon and feel like you still have energy left to give. The trick is you want to run at such a, a, a good enough pace with endurance throughout the whole marathon. By the time you get to the end, it feels like you have spent everything, but you've, you've run the race, you have finished that course. When we get to that end, we want to be able to say, I did everything I could, I did everything I knew how to, I hope I was a good steward of what you gave me, God. I ran that race with endurance, I endured the storm. We can call that living faithfully unto death. Now, not every lesson we can preach on can be on the topic of salvation. James deals mainly with the Christians who have already been saved and how to live that life. But these were people who had named the name of Jesus. They had submitted to his yoke. They had become one with him in the waters of baptism. They had heard that message preached, that Jesus came and died for you and me. He, he suffered an agonizing death on the cross to pay and make atonement for my sins, even though I was still some 2,000 years yet to be born. He did that because of the great love for us. And his offer, an invitation of mercy, still holds. He, uh, he does not promise an easy life, but he promises a blessed life. If you've heard that message and you've been that resonates with you. You believe what Jesus did for you. You're ready to name him as Lord is your life. You're ready to make that good confession before men that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and submit to him in the waters of baptism. This is not me teaching. This is not what the elders are teaching. This is what the book says. In Mark chapter 16, in the 16th chapter, if you have the red letter, you can tell this is the words of Jesus here. Jesus made salvation so simple that's unfortunate that so many miss it in the world. He says, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. But make no mistake, baptism alone will not save unless you remain faithful unto death. That's what Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us. Be faithful unto death and I shall give you the crown of life. So if we can assist you this morning, become united with Christ in baptism, we would love to do so. If you've done that in the past and you're, you've fallen away and you need to be restored to the faith, or you're struggling right now, you need encouragement or strength, the invitation is not only for those who have yet to name the name of Christ, it's for all who need the spiritual encouragement they need. So if you need it all, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>